Okay, so um, hello and welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I'd just like to start off with a disclaimer. I um, uh, apologise for my facial hair. Um, <laughs> it's called Movember. Um, so what we'd like to do today is just uh, talk you through firstly kind of some of the ways in which we came about selecting content management systems for a variety of different institutions and then secondly a bit more kind of in-depth developer perspective about the final choices that we made and what we like about it and what we don't. So um, I guess if we, we'll start with a round of introductions then the plan is we're going to give a kind of brief presentation leading you through that and then really what um, the rest of the time we'd just like to kind of open it up to the floor to uh, go through any questions or uh, discussion points that, that you might have. Uh, feel free to interrupt at any time if there's any specific questions about what people are talking about. Otherwise, it might be better to just wait until the end and we kind of you'll, you'll hear all of our different perspectives and then um, maybe that will answer the questions and if, and if not, we can talk about it together. So, um, we'll just go through with a, a round of introductions. Um, if you could just say kind of who you are, who you work for, who you're going to be talking about, and finally, what CMS is uh, you selected at the end. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Chris Borkowski. Uh, I'm the lead developer at the Balboa Park Online Collaborative in San Diego. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about um, what we're doing with uh, our CMSs and how we came to select them at Balboa Park. And also, uh, for contrast, uh, I recently was uh, switched jobs and uh, before I went to the BPOC, I was at the, the Guggenheim Museum in New York as their lead developer. And um, I'm just going to do a little compare and contrast between Joomla 1.5 and Drupal 6. Hi, I'm Steve Norris. Uh, I'm a colleague of Tristan's at a digital agency called COGAP, based in Brighton in the UK. I'm going to be talking about the CMS selection we did three years ago for the National Portrait Gallery in London. Um, and sort of how we came to those decisions and how that's worked out since you know, three years ago. Really. I'm uh, Tristan Robbins, I'm the Head of Web Development at COGAP. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the project we completed recently in partnership with the Metropolitan Museum of Art and how we ended up selecting Cycle. Hi, my name is Jeff Strickland. I'm the Manager of Application Development at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, I'm going to be talking with uh, Tristan about our um, selection of site for, for our uh, newly launched website. Okay, so Chris, do you want to probably come away with, with your presentation? about um, CMSs. They're all kind of like a, a hammer that you hit a nail with. And um, they're all different, you know, different shapes and sizes. I've, I've had the luxury of being able to, to work with uh, two of the major open source CMSs in, 
the different jobs that I've had, both with the Guggenheim and uh, the Belleville Park Online Collaborative. Um, and uh, throughout my presentation, the, I have to say I, I, I like both Joomla and Drupal for different reasons. Uh, they all sort of excel at, uh, different, in different ways. Um, but they're, uh, they're a real joy to work with compared to, um, let's say, a paid-for application like SharePoint or any of the Microsoft products. <laughs> um, that being said, um, Um, it's estimated there's about about 71 percent of the sites that are out there right now are currently using um, content management systems, and at the top of that heap are actually three three open source systems, CMS systems um, that are that are kind of really dominating the market out there, and uh, the the one that we're, I'm not going to talk about is obviously at the top of the heap um, is WordPress. Uh, it's estimated it has about a 53% market share. Um, that being said, I really never looked at it as as a, a legitimate CMS and types of. Uh, it's more like a. I see it more as a blogging tool, um, but it's a great tool, and I know a lot of people um, like it and use it. And um, it does have an unfair advantage to most of the other CMSs is, is that is WordPress also sells like a hosting service. So uh, with, with a credit card and a few clicks, <coughs> you can be running a, a, a pretty good content management system um, in a short amount of time. And right below WordPress is, is Joomla, uh, estimated somewhere around 9% market share, um, and then right below that is uh, Drupal, which has um, about a 6% market share. Um, why would you want to know those stats? Because when you're working with CMS, particularly an open source CMS, you want to select a product that, that people are using, and, and there's, there's uh, a lot of support out there in terms of uh, paid for uh, development, but free applications, and then also um, just uh, support in terms of forums and conversations about the product that you're about to use. So um, that's one thing to look for. Um, I've had the unique advantage of, of, of of working for a museum and then for currently an organization that services museums, and there's some there's some different things that are that um, as an organization that services museums, we can sort of unilaterally say, okay, this is what you're going to use because uh, this is the product we're offering you, and they can say yes or no. And uh, the BPLC is in that sort of unique position of it's a more client service-based model, but not for it's a non-for-profit model. That being said, uh, you can move really quickly. But if you're an organization like a a, a museum or any other type of non-for-profit institution there's kind of more players at the table that need to be involved during the CMS selection process. And these are, in this, on this slide, there's no particular order, but um, people that really need to be at the table during your CMS selection process are obviously your web developers. Uh, what do they want to use? I mean, uh, developers will kind of go anywhere you tell them, but they certainly have their preferences and um, everyone has a different set of skills and, and knowledge base, but um, I would say give them, let them use the application that they want to use. So, because um, they're the ones who's going to build the site for you ultimately. Uh, right below that is your IT staff. Um, they're going to, you know, do ancillary support for your CMS and your platform, and um, having them all on board is a good idea. 
you don't want a, you don't want an angry IT person saying, well, screw this, I, I don't like your CMS. It's, you know, the problem is, uh, you know, figure it out yourself. <coughs> and then finally, you get into the people that are going to be uh, contributing to your CMS and adding content, and that's typically your editorial staff, your web master, your uh, your web editor, typically, and then graphic designers, marketing and PR, they're going to have a, a big input in the selection process. Uh, membership <coughs> and visitor services, uh, you obviously want to uh, have, have something that they can use as well. Curatorial, that probably should be at the top of the list, really. Um, for some reason, my experience in, in uh, working at a museum, but also talking to other people uh, who develop and run websites for a museum, is actually the curatorial curatorial staff usually seems to have a bigger say than anyone in the process, and uh, it's I, I can't describe why, but it it just it's it's. Uh, that's the, the nature of, of running a, a CMS for a, a institution and museum. And finally, um, your library staff too. Uh, they should have an input because they'll they'll also be wanting to contribute to the website. Chris, yeah, can I disagree with you on one point in that last time? Yeah, I, I actually don't agree with the IT staff. Um, being a major player in this. And I'm speaking as a former client yep. and speaking from the perspective of a lot of clients that I know mm -hmm. who really have felt held hostage by their IT staff um, and their choice of uh, CMSs. I mean, I know a lot of people who felt kind of forced into using Ektron or EpiServer or something like that, which was totally not what the rest of the staff wanted to use. I, I, I agree with you. I mean, <laughs> it, it's totally that's totally true. Um, but then again, you need somebody to to be running the infrastructure, right? Sure. Um, but maybe you need a new IT staff. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, if you I, don't like your students, <coughs> get rid of your IT staff, right? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, maybe. You know, I mean, I I actually know a lot of clients who really regret it going with the advice of their other their head of their IT. I, I agree. I mean, I've, I've, you're not the only one that I've that I've, that I've heard that from. That being said, you do need them for it because who's going to fix the server when it breaks? I like to counter that argument. <laughs> 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 Again, you know, in media to smaller museums, where, for example, our museum, we don't have web developers. You know, we have webmaster. Uh, that are basically content, you know, managerial folks, and so you know, in, th in those kinds of situations, you know, I think it's useful, really useful, to have IT involved in the conversation because, you, you know, we don't. If it was developers that were choosing their tools and said we like to, we want to work on Drupal, or we want to work on a specific platform, mm -hmm. but if you have staff that really doesn't have a lot of expertise in development because you traditionally outsourced it, you know, I think it's important to have, and I think it, a lot of it depends on your IT staff as well, you know, whether they're. You know, open to different solutions or different um, different models of operating than you know just saying, oh, well, you're going to use SharePoint, or you're right. going to use Ektron, or you're going to use something yeah, else. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'd just like to add to that that you know it, it helps to have everybody on board, sure. and so you know when things go well with the IT department, they can actually lend a whole lot to the experience yeah. as well. And so we work with clients with you know very capable IT departments who will make things very easy because they will set up all of the database backups and replication and they'll have you know DBAs who know a lot more about um, sort of the complexities of managing sort of clustered um, application servers and database servers than, than we do with you know with primarily application developers. And again, you know you, you can actually get quite a synergy there when when they do know what they do. I totally agree. That being said, uh, and, I, and I agree with Aaron, your your Windows system administrator should not be <laughs> making the final decision on your CMS. I mean, you do have to have everyone on board and happy with the product, and that leads to our next slide. <laughs> and um, getting everyone on board and bringing like the expertise to the table. Um, you're going to want to select something that everyone is happy with and that they can excel with rather quickly. And that that's like top down from 
your developers, to your editors, to your major contributors to the site, and the IT staff. So if they don't know anything about your product that you're running, they're not going to be so helpful to you. Um, they might sort of, you know, uh, sort of bobble around with it, like w why your CMS is not performing correctly or something's not happening. Um, but you do want a, a product that is <coughs> easy to learn. And this one here is uh, somebody, somebody uh, made a slide here, made a, made a photo who really didn't like Drupal all that much. <laughs> and um, I don't agree with this, but I think it's really funny. <laughs> um, I would, I would, you could probably put every CMS like on the, on the even bar. Um, they're all, they all have their proclivities and they're, and they're kind of difficult and easy to work with in certain, certain different ways. Um, so, as I mentioned before, I had the, you know, I, I've worked with both Joomla for the Guggenheim and uh, Drupal for uh, Belbo Park Online Collaborative. And um, <coughs> the two situations are a little different. Uh, the Guggenheim is obviously it's a, it's a museum and it was pretty much one site that, that I was working on. Um, but for the Belbo Park Online Collaborative, it's actually we're servicing probably 17 different organizations. We're running about 23 different live production websites for, for the different institutions in the park. Um, but we've standardized it. Pretty much almost every single site except for two is running uh, Drupal. <coughs> Um, I'm going to do a side-by-side -side comparison with just some stats here on the two different sites. Uh, the Guggenheim is Joomla 1.5. Uh, Belbo Park, we're using Drupal 6 and different versions of 6 for pretty much everything. Um, BelboPark.org is by far the, the largest site that we, we, we built and administrated at, for the park. Um, and the, here's some just some basic things about the, the site. It's the sites themselves. Um, at the Guggenheim, the site design, the, comp, the, the actual comps was done by uh, <coughs> Pentagram. Uh, the development team for that site uh, was 20 plus. And um, the major developers of that site was, primarily was a company called ID Society. They're called Emerge right now. Um, and they had a, a, a vast amount of experience and expertise in, in Joomla. But uh, some, of the, some of the other parts of the site and other comp Joomla components and extensions were designed by uh, the Guggenheim themselves. Um, and then uh, we've also had uh, a couple of other outside development firms help out with both designing and constructing components for that site as well. Um, when, we, when we built that site, it was a two-year process with Joomla and all the parties involved. And that's kind of, um, I would say it's, it's kind of typical for big organizations to take this slow sort of development process uh, in getting everyone on board becoming familiar with uh, the software, the site itself, uh, in, in sort of, uh, it's a cat wrangling chore. Um, at both, at, at the BPLC, we have a, a, a unique sort of situation where we can unilaterally make decisions really quickly, top down and get everyone on board rather quickly. So if you look at BellBowPark.org, rolling that out on um, Drupal, and it's not saying that there's anything particularly better about Drupal, but the development and rollout process for that site was about three and a half months done by three developers. And that was, it, it's not expertise or software or anything, it's just the ability for the BPOC to really make decisions quickly and, um, and, and, and sort of get everyone on board 
uh, without having to uh, you know, go through long production meetings and arguments and stuff like that. Um, the, the Guggenheim site is hosted at Rackspace. It's a VMware. Um, and the, there's also certain other parts of that website that are hosted internally. Um, at, at BPOC, we use uh, Amazon primarily as, a, as our hosting company. Both of them are LAMP stacks. All the site, both of those sites are under some SVM version control. Um, in uh, both of the, the two sites have different uh, staging servers and sandboxes for, for uh, development work, but also content uh, staging. <coughs> Uh, some of the major features that we, we put into uh, the two different content management systems that make them sort of stand out amongst um, uh, just the out of the box of CMSs is at the Guggenheim there's a, um, there's a component in there that, that does a, a presentation layer of TMS eMuseum uh, content and uh, for those who who might not know what TMS or eMuseum is? It's uh, it's one of the bigger players in, in uh, your collections database management or for museums and collecting institutions. Another major feature of the, Guggen the Guggenheim site that we did was uh, the EAD finding aids presentation component, and that's basically for the libraries who um, who are doing most of the cataloging of documents and. Uh, other other sort of paper paper documents that the, the museum has, has collected over the years. Um, there's a another major feature in the Guggenheim site. It's a call-out component, and it's really sort of kind of ad placement amongst uh, in the templating system for Joomla. Uh, we also built a, a, a video component. Um, sort of a dam system that allows editors to quickly add video content to anywhere in the site. Um, we also have a custom component in there called uh, the Arts Curriculum, and that's like an a, a art-based learning uh, system. Uh, another thing that in the, the Guggenheim site that's pretty major is, is actual a flash-based menuing system, and that was kind of one of the major components that held up the production cycle because it took a really long time to, to get that right. And finally, that site also uses uh, a lot of Cipher fonts. And everyone's probably saying, Flash and Cipher, why did you go that way? Because um, everything's mobile now. And obviously, if it doesn't run on the iPhone, sometimes it, it pretty much doesn't exist. But um, at the end, after we completed that site, we actually ended up doing um, JavaScript uh, uh, versions of anything that was flash driven <coughs> in that site. Over on uh, at, at bellboatpark.org, there's um, there's an aggregated uh, master calendar module that's running in Drupal. That's a major fe feature of that site. And to quickly describe what that is, is um, there's a satellite uh, Drupal site that contains a master calendar uh, for all the institutions in the park. And as we slowly, uh, or quickly, I should rather say, move uh, these organizations to to Drupal, their calendaring system is the content is actually aggregated out of that master calendar into their site. And that 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 data also actually is, is output as an RSS feed. And uh, it feeds our iPhone application for the park. But al also, more recently, we started building uh, Drupal-based information kiosks in the park. And that RSS data also goes to their feeds, automatically updates those uh, CMSs every day. Um, another, another two big features of, of the bellboapark.org site that we've uh, rolled out is uh, Apache Solar faceted search and uh, 
we also have an open X ad server that is uh, feeding into a lot of the, the Joomla, uh, Drupal blocks. <coughs> um, the reasons for selecting the two different CMSs in different cases are, are they're kind of they're kind of varied. At the Guggenheim, it was a it was a selection by committee, and ultimately it came down to the best RFP that that we saw in the in the IT department, which I was part of, was already having really good success with Joomla in in running that for different on different projects, and ultimately it it. It was kind of our, the IT department seal of approval, saying, "Okay, we know Joomla. We can support it in all sorts of different sort of ways." And uh, and ultimately, the so selection came down to uh, uh, a company <coughs> that was willing to, to do most of the development for us. Um, another reason for selecting Joomla is is that it's a very in my opinion, it's a very elegant CMS because it follows uh, the MVC uh, pattern of, of development, um, and it's very predictable and uh, uh, very easy to understand if you, if if you're re if you're familiar with that design pattern. Um, over at the, at Belleville Park, we it, the decision to use Drupal was actually it was made. Prior for prior to me joining that organization, but um, some of the compelling things were to use Joomla was actually Charlie's actually sitting out in the, the the audience here is I know the BPLC really wanted to use the the Babel software that the the IMA developed for for Drupal. Um, it's really pretty amazing stuff uh, when you take a look at it uh, and. We, we we chose Drupal primarily based on the fact that we're going to be r running some Babel sites. And, uh, so what does Babel do? Art Babel is uh, it's kind of a it's a video dam. It allows content editors to upload video to the CMS, and what happens in the in the background is there's a ton of processing that happens. And converting that video into uh, a flash MP4 video, and it's all sort of automated through ASW. Charlie's so, uh, yeah. Art Babel is a, it's a collaboration of 30 partners contributing video to uh, the artbabel.org website. It's all ran on Amazon, and when they upload their videos, it spawns off other Amazon instances to transcode those videos and uh, makes those. Available. Another reason for <coughs> selecting uh, Drupal for BelleVillePark.org and the other sites that we that that we service is uh, if you had to describe Drupal really briefly, it's it's a really efficient and small platform when you take a look at it um, at the at the core of Drupal. Obviously, you can ex extend Drupal out in, in a million different ways, and it. Uh, it, it it's pretty efficient when you when you actually start loading in software and, and running it. Um, uh, another another thing is there's Drupal has a, a taxonomy node paradigm that's that once you sort of understand that uh, it's really easy to organize and create your site rather quickly. Um, it has uh, a, a blocks and regions templating system that that's really actually. It's really stone simple when you when you sort of tear the guts out of it. So when you're developing in designing content, uh, it's really efficient in that way. And that's a uh, part of flash part of the question. Uh, and that's all impacted by Adobe abandoning mobile flash. Say that again. Adobe announced recently that it will abandon mobile flash. It will exit that business. Is that impacting? <coughs> And uh, what was the question? Will that impact you if there's if you they've given built up a lot mobile of flash. mobile flash to support the mobile platform as well? Oh so. no, no. There's actually <coughs> what we 
on the, the Guggenheim site, yeah. there, there's actually, um, we've already written uh, JavaScript versions of what we're doing in, in Flash to sort of have parity there. Okay. And so it's just a matter of, of really toggling the, <coughs> the, the, the if statements that if this particular user agent browser comes to the site, we can just add it. So you already have to put it in Java? No, I don't think so. Does the Art Babel, did the Art Babel videos work? On you guys make MP4 copies, right? So it's not just Flash? Well, it's, everything is MP4s, but we actually haven't yeah. used the uh, right. HTML5 video player. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so, yeah, it's... But you don't have to start over. You've got the rendition made, right? Yeah, we can use the exact same one. Yeah, okay. And how much would that be used to feed now the mobile activity? Pardon? How much of that CMS you use to feed the mobile content that goes to the mobile device? How much of the CMS? Yeah, I mean... Like, percentage-wise? Yeah, I mean, what are some examples of taking that web content and the way you manage it? Oh, okay. And also annotating it to mobile platform? I, I couldn't put a percentage on it. No. Um, I, get, I guess maybe 20% of... Like Bell, at bellboapark.org, like, the calendar is a big part of that site, and it actually, it, it, it aggregates out to our iPhone app, which is really just a, at the heart of it, just, it just reads RSS data and displays it. So 20%, I don't know. Is there, oh, oh, so is there anything inherently different between Joomla and Drupal that make one or the other more friendly towards, about putting the content on a mobile site? Um, uh, I forgot to mention, Drupal has two major modules out there that uh, one is called CCK and the other one's Views, mm -hmm. and it's a, a really probably one of the fastest content prototyping systems that I've ever used. Um, that you don't have to really be like a, a, a knowledgeable sort of computer science major to create really compelling content. <coughs> they kind of give you all the, a nice GUI to just make it happen really quickly. So, um, you know, Drupal may have went out in that, in that sort of thing. Chris, quick question. So you mentioned that our Babel was one of the factors um, in Babel Park. You know, the fact that there was other tools, other community-based tools that you could leverage. Mm -hmm. um, what's the relationship between Joomla and Drupal in terms of community? What you see in terms of community-based development? Where, where do the scales tip? If you were look, if you look kind of broadly across this room and across our community, which one would you say has more? I, I, ha I have to say there's. I think there's a lot of momentum right now behind Drupal, um, <coughs> and uh, it, it's not to say that nothing's happening in Joomla, because it is. It's actually, they just more recently released, I think it's 1.7, um, and they did a lot of really compelling work in the back end of that in terms of uh, how sites are organized, but also user management and access control lists. Um, but uh, the Drupal community is really, they're, they're really uh, passionate about what they're doing right now. And um, cer certainly another big factor was, um, I'd have to say it's whitehouse.gov. In every single new um, 2010 uh, uh, candidates for both the Senate and Congress, they all got Drupal sites. And so that, that certainly kind of like put Drupal into a, a new category and, and, and uh, I think made it sort of empowered the community to get even more excited about that piece of software. Actually, sorry, if yeah, you don't mind, we'll kind of pause on the questions yeah. for a moment. Um, I just want to kind of make sure that we go through mm -hmm. the other presentations first and, and then uh, yeah. get on some more questions. Sorry about that. Thank 
I can post it on the, the on the MCN site. We have yeah. So if you can put it in the comments of your session description, and we have a slide share page MCN. That's so that'd be sweet to link it up there. <coughs> All right. Hi. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a project we did in 2008 for the National Portrait Gallery in London, which is a medium-sized uh, institution, but it's a very um, good biographical resource, um, and sort of any famous, notable British person you want from Henry VIII to Joy Rotten, they've got a portrait of it. So it is a very well-used website, it's used by picture researchers, journalists, etc. As I say, this was in 2008, so some of the stuff I will be talking about, the limitations of CMSs, they have all moved on since, uh, I think I can say, in all of the ones I'm going to mention, they've all moved on for the better. And the process that I'm going to talk about is tailored particularly to this institution. And each time we go through this process, it will change slightly. And you know, I'd be happy to take questions on how we adjust that towards the end. Um, so the first thing to do was... Yeah. <laughs> First part of the process, oh, that's very dark. Um, rest assured, that's a lovely picture of the room in the gallery. <laughs> First part of the process is why did they want to have the CMS? Um, and what were they going from? Now, they were an existing client of ours, uh, but their sites had been as it was for quite some time, and it was largely static pages with a few um, custom systems running dynamic content on it. And so they had quite a limited budget for this migration as well, which led us to decide to keep a lot of the existing custom systems, in particular the online collection, which is a, a huge, huge part of it and see how we can best integrate that with the CMS. Uh, we're also dealing with um, an online shop and a, a press system and then a uh, events calendar which we did actually customer with the CMS in the end. Uh, so we needed to take all of that static content and feed it into a system and integrate with these existing systems and make it something that the staff at the gallery could use on a daily basis to keep their content flowing and do more themselves and keep everything consistent as well. So we sort of went to them and said, you know, what are the most important things that you need to do with this system? And alongside our CMS procedure, we were also running a what is this website going to be, designing the IA, coming up with the wireframing and stuff. And when you do that process, there is a lot of that that can feed in to your CMS selection. And whilst I would say that sort of any competent CMS can do anything you want it to, in a lot of cases you'll find yourself sort of beating a square peg into a round hole to make it do that. In this case, the site that we are looking at was a traditional, hierarchical, largely static content website with a very large online collection portion. Uh, and so some of those sort of more niche considerations I'm not going to go into in this presentation, but you know, we'll take questions on at the end if anyone has them. So the key points we had was, you know, simple to edit. No, that, that was the key thing. It had to be something that would actually help their productivity and help them do more. They needed to support various microsites, lots of different exhibitions running. Simplicity of development, you know, key for us, but also they have a web team that would like to be able to do aspects themselves and they need to be able to work with that. Workflow and permissions was identified there were you know, different departments. They have a core digital media team who take charge of things, but they thought, you know, we might have curators that want to, to add content in certain areas, marketing department <coughs> to push certain things to the front page. 
Um, and finally, open source. And you know, there have been many books written about the open source versus proprietary debate. I've read some of them, not all the way to the end, obviously. <laughs> um, and to be honest, in this particular instance, budget was the key criteria. It certainly wasn't the only criteria. Um, you know, clients were worried about commercial lock-in and you know what happens if if the core proprietary product just disappears. And at the price point we were looking at, no sort of proprietary CMS provided the sort of security and extensibility that we would be expecting. Whereas the open source offerings generally free or, or nominal costly. And you know, whatever happens, there's some way to keep working with them. <coughs> so the first thing we did was draw up the long list, which you know, the first thing is off the top of our heads, what CMS do we know about? What do we work with by the the list? And then do a bit of work and see if there are any new and emerging ones coming up, things that we haven't worked with before, things that are being positively received. And then we come up with a requirements list. So taking those sort of key features that the client had requested in the first place and massively expanding them, saying, you know, what can CMSs do? Let's stick it in a list and say which of these are important. And we learned quite an interesting thing, which is if you ask a client, is this important? <coughs> They say yes. <laughs> so we moved on to the next stage, which was the priority order, which was to say how important are these? And you know, I think we went uh, between one and three, a, a reasonably simple ranking. And during that process, and there were a few iterations of this to actually say, okay, we've still got too many things here that are top priority that can't really be true. And one of the things that we noticed was one of their first sort of key requirements for that very sort of flexible workflow, <coughs> when we sort of got down to it and said, does this really affect how you're going to work? The answer was no. Their key digital media team didn't really trust anyone else to do the editing. And they all sit in one office together. Hmm. So a lot of that sort of went out the window and now actually using the system we designed various roles for them, they all use the same login because they all sit next to each other and you know <laughs> if they need to know if somebody's editing something they ask them. Um, I'm going through this process, ticking things off on the list, saying you know if you haven't got a priority one you're off the list. Uh, we came down to a short list of five and those were Drupal, Joomla, Mambo, Monex, and Play. And as I say, this was 2008, so I think we're talking about Drupal 5, Modex 0.96, um, Play. Play 3. And Joomla and Mambo, I cannot recall. Um, Joomla and Mambo are. They were, they were actually Joomla and Mambo was. It's being it's forked into, yeah. Yeah. to Joomla right around that time, and so. they're almost—they were almost identical products. But yeah, and, and they sort of both went on the list for the sake of completion. Um, I think even at the time it was quite clear that Joomla was going to to be the one that uh, retained the continued support. <laughs> and. So we presented this list to the MPG along with you know, a few things and knocked some off the list. Um, Joomla and Mambo both went largely due to anecdotal concerns of developers we'd read when doing this research that it was very difficult to have complete front-end control. And uh, I don't actually know if it's the same in the States, but in the UK, it was sort of government-funded institutions. 
need accessibility uh, requirements, they need to meet reasonably high levels of accessibility. And so that, that's a major concern. And also anecdotal evidence that it was difficult to develop and, and suffered you know, big roadblocks to, to doing certain things. Plone also went. Plone is a, it's a big beast and it is very good for very sort of high-end websites if a multi-server environment. Uh, it does an awful lot out of the box, but development time is quite slow, it's quite complex to work with, and if you don't have the resources to put all the hardware behind it, it doesn't have the performance. And for what we were looking at, it just it didn't seem the right fit. And just to add that, it's an extremely esoteric software stack. It's um, based on Python, that then there's an application server called Chrome on top of that. And then there's Clone, which is a kind of a CMS layer on top of that. And it's completely different to every other CMS you'll meet. It doesn't have a relational database. It has a hierarchical object store. It doesn't rely on third-party web servers like Apache or IIS. It has its own built-in web server and so on. So it's, it's kind of it's incredibly capable, but it's very, very niche. So if you go clone, you have to fully commit to it, and it's kind of that will be imposing. Okay, so I've just poured ice all over my body, so I make it increasingly <laughs> shrill. Um, so that left us with two, uh, Drupal and ModX. So the next thing that we did was to set up two demo installations, which were essentially stock installs with one basic template, template type and invite the clients down to our offices and say, these are the two systems, so we're going to tell you how to use them and screw into the rerun. <coughs> and what we found was that with Drupal, it was, where is this? How do I find this? What, how do I perform this, this basic function? Again and again and again. With ModX, they were generally clicking around and doing it before we'd even got to the point where we were going to tell them how to do that. And I think it's fair to say that that is not a fair comparison in many ways because Drupal configuration is everything. But in this instance, where as I say we're working with a reasonably standard hierarchical site, bulk of what they're doing is editing static pages and they want people to be able to come in and new, new people join the team they want to expand editing to different parts. They want people to be able to do that without too much overhead on the training. It was all very simple and you know, they loved the system that worked very well. And for that reason, we ended up recommending ModX to them. And three years down the line, it has it's served them very well. Um, and good points speed of development. I, as a developer, I love ModX because it is super fast. You decide what you're going to build and you go in and you build it and it generally works. And from a sort of client perspective, that's quite important as well because it affects certainly the budgets that you've got to, to work with to do things. And if you say, I want a new feature, then we can often get working on that, we can get that developed nice and quickly and out the door nice and quickly, it gives you much more flexibility without necessarily having to say, we want this new feature, we want it in two weeks, oh, we'd better stop all other maintenance work and push all the resources onto it. Uh, as I mentioned previously, Intuitive CMS interface, uh, they've really enjoyed that, they're still working with it, and the flexibility and right at the top of the presentation I said you know they've got some competent in-house staff who want to do things themselves. The way it's set up <coughs> it allows them to work on little sections, little areas and produce things <coughs> that integrate nicely with the whole ecosystem and they don't have to think about the whole ecosystem. 
they can think, I want to develop something and it is going to go onto my page, it's going to go into my hierarchy, it's going to integrate with these other systems. And it all works nice and easily. And finally, customization. We've not yet run into anything we've been asked to do and it's been a real headache. Everything that we've we have tried to do with the system, we have been able to do with the system. <coughs> but there have been downsides. Um, when we picked it, it was in some ways a, a risky option. <coughs> it certainly seems like the best fit in terms of its feature sets, in terms of its usability. But it wasn't as mature as many of the other systems out there. And you know, over the, those three years, it has matured. One of the ways it's matured is that they've rewritten it all from the ground up, which has forked the code into evolution and revolution varieties. We are still using the original evolution variety on this site. And the upgrade to the revolution is it's on the roadmap, but it's going to be a reasonably big task to undertake. And you know that, that is one of the sort of open source issues that you encounter. You don't really know if that's ever going to happen, when that's going to happen. Um, but having said that, the previous code base is still maintained in terms of bug fixes, security patches. It still works, you know, pretty well for most tasks. Um, I've used the new revolution version for building new sites. Uh, it's brilliant. I would hardly recommend it for the things that it does well. Other disadvantages, limited third-party modules. Um, and when I say limited, we're talking sort of in comparison to Drupal, whose one great strength is I want to do something, let's go and see who's made a module for it. Generally, somebody has made a module for what you want to do. More often than not, three people have made a module for what you want to do, and then you've got to decide which one to use. Modex, a lot of that stuff, there is sort of lower level modules, and so you couldn't necessarily get a whole e-commerce integration system, but you might find something that does a shopping cart, uh, and then you have to build the rest on yourself. There is no versioning out the box, there's no complex workflow set up, which has not thus far with this client proved to be a problem. But you know, conceivably, if they they move to a, a more distributed working environment, say, or they have requirements from other departments to get more involved, that could threats help as an issue. And finally, the slight lack of separation between content and code and templates. The same issue in Drupal um, and in many CMS systems. And the reason this is a problem is that you can't use your <coughs> sort of traditional development versioning tools like Subversion to make sure that everything is backed up and recorded and if something goes wrong you can just fix that bit of content from your backup without then having to revert all of your content for the last week. Um, and similarly, if you're working in a sort of distributed development environment, if you were working with a client that does a lot more of their own development on the core, that would be much more difficult to, to maintain and to, to synchronize your efforts in that way. And um, yeah, that is the, the end of that. Um, if we move straight on and uh, yeah, take questions at the end if uh, anyone has them. Okay, so um, I'd like to just quickly talk about kind of the, the equivalent process that uh, we went through much more recently with the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, the essentially here there were there, there, I think a very different set of circumstances to um, 
it's safe to say. Uh, some of the key challenges when it came to selecting the content management system um, came from the, the museum itself, in a sense, in that there's, within the museum, it's a very large museum, there are many different um, competing requirements, and some a bit, a bit like Chris mentioned, you know, there's a whole host of different types of people within a large organisation, all of whom should have a say. And in that sense, it, it was very useful to be an external agency where we, we kind of had this one level of remove and were seen as being a little more impartial about that selection um, than if it had been kind of being pushed forward by one particular department in the museum. Um, there was obviously a lot of technical challenges. A uh, big museum, a lot of existing systems, a lot of systems that need to continue to be maintained. And so we had to integrate with a, a lot of the systems that are still in use there. Obviously the, the collections management system, but also Tessitura that's used for um, events and ticketing. Um, and then a, there was a, uh, an in-house developed um, single sign-on system and various other things that kind of that we, the, the CMS had to plug into um, other things rather than just acting as a standalone unit. There's also the, the ecosystem in which it lived, and firstly, the technical ecosystem. The um, museum has uh, a very large existing Microsoft-based infrastructure, and the, the human ecosystem. There are, there are in -house, an in-house development team that Jeff heads up, and again, the background of the developers, it's all .NET based and um, Microsoft. There's, there's also a problem of content. There's a lot of content to be migrated from uh, the previous site, and we had to um, be sure that any CMS we selected would allow us to do that. And then finally, it's looking forward. What is going to happen to that content in the future? We knew from the outset that there would be a, a mobile version of the site, um, as well as the web version. But in future, there's the museum is obviously keen to be able to reuse this content as much as possible, whether it's to drive in gallery kiosks or, or anything else. So we have to keep an eye on that. Um, when it came around to selecting things, obviously, as you know, in the same case, the MPG, it's important that the users of this CMS like it. If they, the first thing they do, you know, they've got to live that thing day in, day out. If they hate using it, if it's clunky and so on, then you're really doing them a disservice. So that was key. As I mentioned, developer experience here, I'm talking about the experience of the developers, as, in, as I realize I'm using the word experience in two different ways. Um, talking about the background in Microsoft technologies and something that would create a good fit with that. Workflow and permissions, again, here, um, what was key because the, the organization is a lot larger. Um, versioning, again, uh, very important to be able to uh, do things like um, roll back content to, to be able to compare content to see who made what change at what time. And then the, the big choice, um, where to go with a commercial proprietary offering or where to go with one of the open source um, systems. And finally, the, the key concern of, of you know going forward, how well supported is the CMS going to be in terms of training for CMS users, developers, the available documentation and um, support offerings. So how do we go about it? Well, we, you know, first of all, again, worked up all of these criteria into a, a requirement spec. Um, and then we kind of stood back a bit and, and decided, well, before we launch into this, let's, let's take a long view and let's look at what other museums are using. And so we, uh, we looked at, I think, 15 different museums and kind of found out what their CMS, what CMSs they were using. Wherever possible, we tried to contact somebody from within one of those organizations to actually get some feedback about how, how they're getting up with the CMS they're using. And I think what we found is that there's absolutely no standardization. There's, there's no one size fits all. There, there's no clear winner even in terms of open source versus commercial. There's, uh, there, there's a lot of museums using Java-based systems, a lot using .NET-based, a lot using LAMP, and then within LAMP it's, okay, well, is it you know, Drupal, Joomla, uh, Django, uh, in-house stuff, there's people using Mod Pearl, and you know, so it's kind of, th there is no 
there's there's no kind of obvious thing to one CMS to choose in that, that it's um, very varied. Um, so we then looked at okay, what CMS are available. We came up with a long list of around 20 different ones, largely Microsoft-based, some some Java, um, and we did a lot of research. Now, we the first thing that happens, a lot of these are commercial. What we discovered very quickly is when you express the slightest interest in purchasing, um, <laughs> yeah. especially one that costs a lot of money, then you'll be hounded until the day you die. <laughs> so th th that can actually work to your advantage. Um, and so what we did was, was sort of turn this around and we drew up a, a questionnaire of about 40 different questions asking sp as specific as we could be about how uh, the, what sort of hardware requirement, everything from kind of the infrastructure, what sort of hardware requirements to the licensing costs to the editing interface to the types of content output to video and uh, audio, things like that. And we gave every single vendor the same questionnaire and asked them to fill it in. And so what that gave us was a kind of way to quickly compare across the board, well, how, how do, or at least, you know, according to the vendors, <laughs> how does their offering stack up against the others? Um, so from taking that and, and discussions with the men, we came down to a short list of uh, about five, and um, I'll, I'll go through those in a second. Again, there was a, a presentation of all of these to uh, the museum, and you know where where possible, we also set up and, and installed demo systems locally so that we could actually play around with this ourselves. So uh, you know. Commercial vendors are very keen to do online demonstrations, but they will obviously be steering you very much through the, the good points that they're offering. Um, it's very uh, important, if you can, to set up your own install of it and, and just kick it around yourselves and see uh, you know, if, it, if you can find the things that don't feel so intuitive or so um, uh, well fleshed out. Um, so. We then uh, presented this shortlist to the museum, and from that came down to a, a final two. And then, again, we, we invited the vendors of those two to come in and uh, present to us. But again, we tried to set the agenda there and, and came up with a, a list of about a dozen different scenarios for uh, daily use of that CMS and ask, ask them to actually, instead of responding in writing, to actually give us a demo, a tailored demo, to say, so how would you compare two previous versions of a page and then just find out which one was correct? There, there's various scenarios that we got them to run us through and actually present um, in the museum. I was listening in over uh, web, web Um and then finally, you know, we prepared a, a recommendation report uh, that was presented to the museum. And to spoil the surprise, we uh, finally ended up choosing the site court. But what was on that short list, um, essentially there was a, there was a mix of, uh, they, they, you see these are all .NET based systems. And like I say, the, you know, one, what, one of the key priorities was to fit in with the existing ecosystem at the museum. Um, there's the three there that are Cycle, Open Tech, SharePoint are commercial, and Umbraco and N2 are open source. And what you find, I suppose, you know, predictably, is that in the world of .NET development, there's a very much there's a, a huge preponderance of commercial offerings versus open source, whereas um, in the, the LAMP world, it's it's almost the it's the other way around. Um, quickly to talk about uh, some of the reasons that we rejected these things. Um, open text, it was I think formerly called Red Dot, and the, the reasons we weren't keen on that one is that um, certainly developers who I spoke to who used it gave it very mixed reviews um, and, and kind of claimed it could be quite inflexible and impenetrable even. And then, but I think the key thing was the company future was just very uncertain. They'd been bought out by another company. Everything was now under the open text umbrella. We'd also acquired another Java-based CMS. And it was just very hard to know whether they'd be around in five years or not. Um, the, 
then there was the um, Umbraco. Now, I was talking to Jeff about this earlier, and, and he said, I think fundamentally it, it lacked shininess. But, um, you know, so Sitecore has a, a, a very, very capable, very fancy editing interface. It's got loads and loads of buttons and tabs and, and everything else. Um, and Umbraco, by contrast, is a lot simpler. So I'd say if you were being uncharitable, you'd say it lacks bells and whistles. If, um, so no, if you've been charitable. Either way, um, the, uh, the, the, the other point, though, would be that if those bells and whistles are needed, then you would have to factor in extra development time to actually develop these things in-house to provide them. And so there's, there's some bits where you can say, yes, this is just you know, icing on the cake that we'll never actually use. But if there are key things that you, you really identify as a need, <coughs> then you have to be prepared to, to provide uh, the extra time and effort to go ahead and build those things out. I just going to say that Umbraco has, um, I'm pretty familiar with Umbraco. We actually had implemented it on the site uh, prior to uh, moving to Sitecore for, for the relaunch. Umbraco has a very uh, plain uh, sort of interface but simple is how, how I would put it. In fact, it's, it's very easy for uh, pretty much any content editor and for developers as well to understand. Uh, but it's not shiny. Right? So, so when, when we had the Sitecore demo, there were um, a few features that were demoed as part of that, and the content editor saw these features, and they went, wow, right? when you can look at this, is, this is really neat, you can add it in the context. Um, whether or not that turns out to be a feature that they will use is, is another question, right? But it's appealing. It's, on demo, it's, it's pretty appealing. Um, and in contrast, the open source offering that, that we were looking at um, was, was not as shiny. I just I, I kind of say about the shininess factor of, of how appealing to a, to a, co a decision by committee. It, it is a big selling point. That being said, uh, Drupal is probably the least shiny CMS out there. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't mean that it's not capable. Right. right, right. But that is a, that is an important thing. Like after the install, and you you know fire it up, and you know uh, people are are really kind of taken with like like how great it looks and feels like on the first few clicks. It's a big important part. There are now shininess modules available. <laughs> 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 the, they tried to make it shinier in version seven. Um, I think the short answer is it didn't play into so my much. decision yeah. too much. Um, this was something that we we effectively referred to the museum to firstly actually negotiate that price because I'm, I'm guessing and hoping that we get a very different price to you if you may be a, a multinational bank or something. Yes, yes. Um, I'm just wondering how what level as a museum is priced out of itself. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it is interesting, this, this idea of kind of scale and then selecting the right type of CMS for the right size of your organization. Um, and I mean, I was amused to actually be rejected by one of the CMS vendors when we approached them, uh, which was SDL Trees. And they, they said, sorry, you're just not big enough. So I mean, they, with a mere 20,000 pages of content, um, they didn't even want to hear from us. So, you know, it, it works both ways in that, you know, there, there are CMSs that are just too big and there are CMSs that are, that are too small. And, and you know, that, that works both in terms of price and in terms of uh, capability as well. I think Sitecore is, is sort of positioned as a market. So it's, it's not it's not dirt cheap, but it's not, it's not terribly expensive either. And I guess, of course, that's going to be assessment in some institution. But for, for us and with the, the pricing, and, and we, we're, we're not paying the same price because of that. It's not too bad, but it's a little painful when we, in a sense, it's a little painful when we think there are three options that if I wanted to add another server, it would not be necessary to buy a license. And if I want to add another delivery server, but it's like, you have to buy another license. Yeah. 
But there's support that comes with that. So. And I, I mean, the other thing I found is it, it's very hard to get an actual price from a vendor because, firstly, they're very cagey about it, but secondly, every single, they, they, none of them have a simple price structure. It's not like buying a you know, pound of apples or something. It's always going to be how many concurrent users have you got using CMS, how many different servers, how many staging servers, how many warm standby servers. It's kind of, it just goes on and on. And, and only once they've gathered all of that information will they then finger in the air and say, yes, it's going to cost this much. Um, so, yeah, so, so Umbraco, did, another point about Umbraco was they, at the time we were evaluating, we were talking about making a change, a move to using um, Microsoft MVC as the uh, kind of un underlying principle for organizing all of the, the templates and so on. But so just for this. Okay, and so, so that's out now, and again, it was just that slight concern that would, would we be going down one route when actually what we really wanted was the MVC stuff, but it's just around the corner. Um, N2, the other open source offer, offering, I think I've heard it described as Epi server done right. Um, and, you know, again, for, as far as developers are concerned, they really quite like it. I think the key problem here was firstly, again, scale. It, uh, it lacks the bells and whistles and shininess. Um, but also, it's, it seems to be mainly driven by one developer. And so there's just that riskiness that it may be technically great, but we're a bit beholden to just one guy. And if he moves his interest or gets run over by a bus, who knows what's going to happen. And then even the lack of commercial support that, you know, I think that the sweet spot for open source is when it's big enough, it's mature enough that you do actually have the option to yes, pay somebody to come in and act as a consultant or a trainer or whatever else. And certainly that, that exists for a lot of open source systems out there, but it doesn't for do. And then finally, there was uh, SharePoint. I think the reasons that we rejected that was it was just a lot of it is its background that you know it's come from a sort of a, 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 a you know it's a collaborative document editing it's an intranet portal style thing and it's only recently shifting into the, the WCM space as the jargon goes of web content management and the the idea that it wasn't focused purely on web stuff also, just anecdotally, a lot of developers hate using it, and this is all meant to have got a whole lot better with SharePoint 2010, but again, at the time we were evaluating this, it, it was pre-release, and so there was no track record, it's unproven, it was like, well, are we really going to just take the promise of something better without actually some, some solid recommendation? Also, one other sort of ugly crackdown on information on SharePoint is, what's it, what's it, was it fun? Horrible beginnings in Microsoft content management. System. Yeah, which is universally hated. I think. Yeah, <laughs> I, it, I, I said I was agnostic to, to most CMSs. There's one out there, thankfully, it's dead, and that's Microsoft Microsoft Content Management System, which is now this monster called SharePoint. Um, and then finally, kind of so so reasons then why we selected Cycle was. You know, firstly, none of the disadvantages that I've mentioned for all the others, <laughs> but in general, you know, it was there. Is, it was a mature CMS product. They're on version six at the moment. It seems to be a stable company, and it, again, crucially, it's a company that's focused on web content management. They don't do anything else. And also, something I find quite reassuring is that they, they make almost all of their money from licensing. So their key priority is to make it better and to sell it, rather than a lot of companies, especially at the high-end CMSs, where actually you look at it and they don't really want developers to develop, they want you to buy it and then buy their consultancy and setup package and then they actually go ahead and set it all up for you and then go, there you go, but you are then beholden to them to continue to maintain and improve that system. So the fact that it was focused on selling it and getting, you know, providing the tools for developers to use. And then it just seemed to be flexible enough for all of the kind of the initial requirements of that integration on the system. So I now let Jeff talk a bit more about what's what what you know, more specifics about what we liked and did. Okay, so what do we like about about our choice? Um, 
Cypor, again, as, as Tristan uh, mentioned, has um, is, a, is a stable and pretty um, solid company that, that has uh, training and support uh, available to um, to anyone trying to implement. So all of our uh, and, and one and conversely, you know, bad about Cypor. Uh, all of our developers and everyone involved with the project, with the exception of a couple of developers in Mumbai who could not get to training, um, had training and, and required training in order to be able to get up to speed with Cycor because it is, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a beast um, to get up to speed with. So the training is sort of essential. But the vendor does, does supply that and the courses are, are pretty good. And I think we now have several Cycor certified Developers um, uh, between Kadak and, and the Met. Uh, Cycor also uh, again is a pretty solid and um, responsive company. Um, they do upgrade on a pretty regular cycle. You, you could, I guess, see that as a good or good and a bad. Um, the upgrades uh, are, are good to deal with the problems and, and features. Um, upgrading CMS is not always a simple process. We, we did one upgrade um, prior to launch, which was very nice to have the luxury before we were actually live um, to, to go through an upgrade process. And, and even in that process, um, prior to launch, we, we ran into some issues. Uh, I think it, uh, it kind of depends on the, the extent of the upgrade. There's um, <coughs> There's another point upgrade or, or under a point upgrade I'm about to do shortly that looks like it's going to be fairly painless. And, and the application offers a, when there are no significant schema changes, the application offers a pretty easy way to do upgrades just through a package you know, import system. It, the, in, in this instance, it seems to work um, pretty well. The, the nice CMS interface, um, again, that's sort of the shininess. Factor. So when, when our content editors saw the, uh, the editing interface that they thought they would be using, um, they, they, were, uh, they were impressed with it. And I think what they were mostly impressed with was the in-context editing as opposed to the sort of standard developer um, field-based uh, interface. Now, Sitecore has both of those, right? So it has an in-context editor um, and what that if that's not clear, what that means is you open up the page, the, the web page, and, and you edit on the page itself as it, as it appears to the public. Um, that is one option for, for uh, editing in Sitecore, but it's not the only one. And where they actually are doing the vast majority of the work, in fact, I think all of the work is actually in the sort of standard field-based um, interface inside Sitecore. Um, but they seem to be, uh, so again, as a, as a plus of cycle, the, the, the editors um, have, have um, pretty quickly um, gotten up to speed with using it, and we don't get too many questions um, from the content editors on how to, how to do what they need to do, which is nice. But for, for, for me as the, the, um, the manager of the development team, it's nice to not have to deal with those types of questions. Um, between separation of content and presentation, I think that's probably just sort of a standard um, CMS feature, I hope. We, um, it, it's nice that we have this now. I can tell you in our prior site, we had, it had been built over uh, several years. We had classic ASP and .NET, and then the classic ASP, if any of you have ever worked with it, uh, you may be familiar, or at least uh, maybe familiar with the term spaghetti. Uh, so we, we had quite a bit of that. We had a lot of mixture of code and, and content um, and with site board. Um, we really don't have that at all. The, the content is, is completely um, handled inside the, the editing interface and managed by content editors, and the developers deal with the code, and, and that keeps it pretty nicely separate. I so just to add to that, the one particular feature I like about Sitecore is so they could obviously break all the content out in separate fields so that could be reused in kind of any way you care to program it. But they also have a concept of devices, so you can visit one particular page within the, the hierarchy that is the site 
and depending on the device you're using, it will then switch to using a, a different rendering. And so this was extremely useful for implementing the mobile side, is that you keep your exact same site structure, but then for certain sections of it, you'll say, if I visit this page and my uh, you know, user agent is identified as a mobile, switch to a completely different view of the content. So you, as a developer, it's very easy to have that extremely flexible control. And that for you fits to the different screens or all different devices, whether it's a flat panel display or a mobile device or a tablet. It's a, a, I mean, it's, as a developer, it's, it's up to you how you can, how you configure that. So I, in the case of the Met, we just have you know literally two versions. You're either desktop or your mobile, and I think tablets we we make the decision you're going to have the desktop. Um, but you know you could add any sort of you could add a new tablet device and then have some different criteria that would you know trigger the that particular view of the content as well if you want. And then other devices, you know, we've got things like RSS devices, we'll have JSON devices. It would be very easy to put a kind of API layer over your website with, with something like that as well. So it's, it's, it, it plays nice into that idea of future reuse of the content. You can repurpose it as you see fit. So, and Sycor is, is a very extensible uh, application. And I, so far, we haven't found, I think, with the original ModX, we haven't really found too much that we wanted to do or that we think we might want to do that can't be done um, with Sycor. It has a, a, a large API, and it's a well documented API. Um, we did, I don't know if we have the negative side of the higher nature. Um, we, we had a section, we have a section of the site that didn't fit nicely into the, into the sort of hierarchical nature of Sycor, this, this tree structure of Sycor. Um, <coughs> we were able to to make a request of Sycor to send us a Sycor guru for a couple of days. Uh, who, who took a look at what we were trying to do and found a way within Sitecore to actually make this work. Um, the disclaimer is we didn't get that done in time to actually make it into launch, so there's, uh, there's still some work to do with it. But even though this, um, and it, it was, a, it was a, a non-relational structure that we needed to, um, I'm sorry, a, a bi-directional structure that we, need, we needed to, to be able to implement. Um, uh, linking items across the entire site instead of just finding a relationship from a uh, parent and a child, right? which is a pretty easy relationship to, uh, to pull out of Sycor, but to, to create bi-directional links across items around the site is not, was not. It also has sort of a, a limitation on the number of children that, that, it, uh, that it will happily handle for performance reasons, so they have suggestions on the number of items that you might want to, the maximum number of items you might want to have under any parent, which I think was 100 uh, <coughs> items. But this, this uh, Sycor developer who came, uh, came out to us actually found a way around that and a way to hide that in the structure. Um, now, um, it, it's not a true, it's not a true fix, it's not a true implementation, it's a workaround, right? So it's using Sitecore's um, native structure and sort of working around its own limitations um, to implement something beyond what that they might be. And interestingly, this work that, uh, that this developer did, um, I'm fairly certain is going to make its way into the next version of Sitecore. So we, we did present them with a problem that they hadn't really had to deal with uh, before, and they found a solution for it, and they didn't actually put them back into the next version. So the, the future preview, multilingual in context, I've talked a little about the, about the in context, I would say the future preview is kind of an interesting uh, feature that Sitecore had, and again, that was uh, the sh one of the shining things that I thought was demoed, um, or it was part of the, the demo in that, uh, I'm not, uh, I don't know that much about the people, um, so I can't say that this is a, you know, some of the other you know, non-Microsoft um, uh, CMSs, so I, I don't know if this is a fairly Common feature, or if it's just something that Sitecore has. But um, within Sitecore, you can 
set a date in the future to see what the site is going to look like at that point in time. Right. So the, the editors thought that that was, that was very cool. So they could set publishing times for, uh, for items and then you know, move forward uh, in the future and see what the site will look like. It, it's cool. I don't know how much it's actually used, but I think it's really cool. I, I think there's actually only one place we use it in earnest on the site, and there's, a, there's an artwork of the day feature on the Met site. So actually that, again, it, it was nice. It, these are, I think a lot of these things, they're sort of bells and whistles. They're not core features that are used, but in a sense, they sometimes can be really useful and nice to have. And so if that's the thing that artwork of the day, you just say, hit preview, hit that date button, click forward or select the date you want to see, and it will show you what you have put into the CMS to be displayed then, which, again, will, if it hadn't been there, we would have had to kind of come up with some sort of interface for them to be able to preview it and then write it themselves. Uh, CEP, which is the um, latest version, what does it say? Customer Engagement Platform. Okay. It used to be online marketing suite and then digital marketing DMS, and now it's customer engagement platform. It's changed the name every few months or so. Yeah, they promised to stop changing. Okay. All right, but uh, th that's also a very appealing uh, part of the application, and that's that. Um, it, it's uh, Sitecore's way, or um, the Sitecore, the company's uh, mechanism for um, analytics and for also tracking uh, user behavior across the site. So we be able to uh, record uh, user activity, do A B testing, sort of thing, which, which sounds very good. It's not something we've actually implemented yet on our site, but it is something that we. Um, Actually, our, our email marketing person has, uh, has made a request for it, so it, it, is, it, it is going to be implemented on our site in the not too distant future. Uh, we, we implemented a version initially just to sort of capture the uh, most popular uh, articles in, in our blog section, in our internet, uh, which we then we had a couple of issues with not realizing if, if, you're, if you're reporting. Um, you know, every hit on a site that, that gets a lot of clicks, your database is going to get really large, really fast. Right? So I think in a period of about two and a half weeks, we had over six million records in a database that was uh, not designed to, to handle that. So we had to, we had to drop back from that, uh, pull it out, and, and rethink exactly how we're going to be able, if we want to do this sort of uh, real tracking of, of user activity, we have to really plan about how we're going to handle that. I talked about the dependency on, on hierarchy. Um, uh, one of the good things I didn't, I didn't mention, um, it's, 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 a, it's, sort of a, it's, a, it's a good and bad, there's a, there's a product um, not made by the company side for, but uh, by a partner, a third party vendor called uh, Team Development of Sitecore that we found very, very useful in, in our development process. And, and what it does is serialize the, the items. Um, uh, so you can actually store the items uh, in the content management system in source control, which is very nice. Um, so with a, with a development team, um, and we had a distributed development team. We had a team in, in uh, Brighton working with team, team developers. They had a team at the Met and a team in, Mom, in Mumbai and all working on different schedules. Keeping all of those um, in sync is, is a challenge. Um, this made it much, much uh, easier, I think, than, than the alternative, which would have been um, packages, this, this concept of packages that Cycle has where you, where you export um, uh, items, everything that like Cycle is an item. So, so with TDS, with this, with this product, we were able to, um, as developers creating you know, templates or um, new items in, in, the, uh, in the CMS, we could check that into our source control system, the TFS. Other developers could then just get latest and they're back in sync. So it, it really made I think, uh, a much, uh, much better process than the So, so, um, so I guess. Uh, the bad would be if that wasn't there, it would have been a very, very difficult process and would take much longer. Sitecore is, uh, it's kind of a beast, right? It's kind of complicated to get up to speed. It's, uh, the, the, the next, the next uh, the, the blinking cursor 
when you start with a site core, you get a blank page. Right? So, <laughs> it's not sort of you know, with WordPress, um, you can select a theme and, and start running. Um, you just get nothing. And until you start creating some, some items, some templates, some, some data structures inside site core, I mean, some simple layouts in some way, you know, to, to actually um, put the content on the page. Uh, there's nothing there. And it takes a little while to figure out how to actually do that to get it on the page. Um, once you figure it out, it, it's, it's not so bad, but it does take a little bit to get there. Um, kind of difficult to create the unit test. You guys did more than I'll let you, if you want to talk. Uh, you know. Yeah, there was, I mean, we came up with a strategy to do so, but in a sense it, it meant completely working around Cycle. There was also, a, I attended the Cycle virtual users group about techniques for unit testing in Cycle, and I was sort of in, in some ways gratified to learn that they couldn't come up with anything amazing. <laughs> but also, it, it's, it, you have to jump through a lot of hoops to be able to effectively unit test. Um, a lot of the documentation that holds it, I guess there, there's a tremendous amount of documentation for, for Cycle. The, the company has a, you know, a portal um, that uh, at one point I think was restricted to Cycle certified developers. It seems to be more open now to, to anyone who um, is willing to request the access. Um, I'm not sure, if actually, but I didn't run into to really, maybe as many documentation holes. I can't really list that as a, as a negative. I thought there was maybe too much documentation at times. And I, but I think sometimes you said it, because it's a mature product, you often stumble across things. But it's like, oh, this is applicable to two versions of the cycle. And so the, the documentation won't be so relevant. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, I think we're, we're pretty much running out of time. Um, yeah. I don't think we're going to get to the next one. So, we, we have the question, we have the question. Okay. We have time for about one question. Any questions? Two questions. <laughs> Anyone? I actually have a question. Uh, okay. Uh, are you stuck with using Visual Studio to develop in the Stuck. Yes. Yeah. That seems, that's a weird paradigm that I could never get over. That you actually have to pay your IDE just to edit your site. And we pay for our site? Yep. But we, we actually like um, the studio. I'm not a, saying it's a bad product. It's a pretty good It's, um, it's a pretty amazing It really is a good IDE. Um, it's good to debug and to work out. And if you're all in Microsoft shop, yeah. I mean, that IDE is, is really capable of seeing your whole entire enterprise and putting it at your development fingertips all at once. I mean, I think what, what I found, because this was my first experience of kind of large-scale Microsoft-based development, is that it is a very different mindset in that, essentially, yes, you will be paying license <coughs> fees at every turn, you know, so there's a cycle license fee, but hey, it runs on SQL Server, that's going to need licensing, and it's on Windows 2008 server, well, that needs licensing. And your developers need to use Visual Studio, well, that needs a license. And then to use it effectively as a third party team to develop a site, well, that needs a license. And, you know, and it's kind of, yeah. it's very different from the kind of open source where, hey, okay, let's download the tarball, <coughs> expand it, and then, you know, I'll sync it everywhere. That, yeah, well, there's something nice about open source stuff that you could, you could build your entire site in a, a, a SSH session you, in using Vim or Nano or something. That requires a developer on staff and all that. We had Rich Barrett's Hall gave a good open source session last year that got into that a lot more than we have time to today. But it's a, it's a different skill set than a licensed supported, and I'm with you, but it's a different skill set yeah. than a lot of museums have in house. Yeah. That's another session. Yeah, uh, last question, to kind of just to wind you up. I've never heard Drupal described as efficient and small. Yeah, no. <laughs> but you had that on your plus list, and maybe that's just my... The core limited. package is, yeah, is actually yeah. really tiny. But does it I'm ever actually... Run, I mean, if you, if you left it alone and didn't add a module, if you didn't add views or CCK, but everyone does, and immediately you look at how many calls to your database... Man. That, well, yeah, there's a <laughs> there's an exception there. Actually, it's, it's crazy if you look at the... This, the, the 
queries that Eve's actually writes. It's like the most long-winded SQL statements that you'll ever... But that's the price we get for the UI, where it's drag and drop view creation. No, but that being said, the core, you download the latest release, it's actually a tiny piece of software compared to Joomla. That's fair. And as Chris said, Eve's is fantastic for a prototyping environment. You want to test that your UI, your IA works, you build it in Eve's. If you have some performance problems, then you've got to go in and rewrite it. It's very fast through those initial stages. For sure. No, it was just struck me when I saw that. Really? Thank you. Thank you.